Alana Garcia, and it's time to set sail and explore the secrets of the Caribbean. The Caribbean, a region of dazzling beauty, overwhelming our senses with sights, sounds, and mystery. Join us as we explore the secrets of the Caribbean. Hi, I'm Ana Garcia. Welcome to another edition of Secrets of the Caribbean. We're aboard the SV Mandalay, and as usual, we've got some wonderful stories for you and fascinating people. The Caribbean and the sea are as one. You don't think of the magical islands without thinking of blue, shimmering waters. And somewhere on those waters, the sails of a tall ship. For us, our tall ship is the SV Mandalay, and its history is as rich as the region it sails. The SV Mandalay is nearly a century old. For nearly 30 years, she was called Vima, owned by Columbia University. She was one of the foremost oceanographic research vessels in the world, and her contributions to the world of science, priceless. Tradition, it is important to the people of the Caribbean and to the crew of the SV Mandalay. History and tradition come together for one of the SV Mandalay's most important traditions, as you'll see and hear. The Caribbean and its people are defined by their relationship with their traditions, their culture, and the sea. From the historic tall sailing ships to today's mega cruise liners, the sea has connected the region, serving as both a source of sustenance and sometimes a place of conflict, but always a constant in the lives of the Caribbean people. The era of the tall ships was a time when magnificent vessels sailed the seas. Although in recent years, Hollywood has turned them into entertainment, and made these wonderful vessels little more than action figures. Welcome aboard the Black Pearl. We must save her. Where do we start? Jack Sparrow. He talked about the Black Pearl. Make a deal with him. He could lead us to it. Fortunately, present day reality is much less intense and certainly quieter. Ten years we search. For us here at the Secrets of the Caribbean, the tradition of the sea is defined by our home away from home, the SV Mandalay, a tall ship with a storied past. Here's our Jim Scott with more. It's a vision rarely seen on the sea in this day of mega cruise ships or floating hotels holding upwards of 3,000 passengers. The SV Mandalay is a reminder of a simpler time when the winds took intrepid explorers to the four corners of the earth. Built in 1923 by the legendary financier E.F. Hutton as a gift for his wife, the 236-foot barkentine was first christened Hussar and, at the time, was one of the most luxurious private sailing ships in the world. In the 1930s, she was sold to shipping magnate George Vettelson, who rechristened her Vemma. When World War II broke out, Vesselson's wife donated Vema to the American war effort, and she was put into service as a merchant marine cadet training ship. But after the war, she entered a new phase of her distinguished history as the Lamont Geological Observatory, a research unit of Columbia University, leased the vessel and soon bought it. Sailing more than a million miles, the Vema became renowned as one of the world's most productive oceanographic research vessels. Ending a career as a research vessel and rechristened the SV Mandalay, she began a new career as a cruising yacht, accommodating 58 passengers and about 24 crew. She's been lovingly restored with teak decks and original woodwork throughout the ship. For her master, Captain Sly, it is an honor to sail her. And we have been sailing the waters of the Caribbean, you know, the same waters, Columbus Pass, and other seafarers uh, pass in the past. So certainly it's an honor 
uh, to be actually mount the helms of the Mandalay. Uh, probably one of the, the last existing ships still in the waters as I speak today. Uh, so I feel totally honored and tall to be on the Mandalay as the, as the master of the ship. Sailing the Mandalay is a very different cruise experience, leisurely, serene. Passengers visit parts of the Caribbean that the mega cruise ships bypass or can't visit because of their size. It's a return to a time when tall ships fanned out throughout the Caribbean. Today, there is only a handful of the fabled tall ships still plying these waters, but for those on board, When the Mandalay unfurls all of its sails, the thrill of moving through the water, powered only by the wind, and with the only sound being the gentle splash of the waves being parted by the sleek hull of the Mandalay. It is an experience unlike any other. The past and the present merge in a truly unique experience. Here aboard the SV Mandalay, the pace of life is wonderful, but there's always a hint of excitement about what we'll find over the horizon. From 1953 until 1981, the Vima, as the SV Mandalay was then known, had a very different mission, one that could hardly have been imagined when she was built back in 1923. Vima was one of the most important oceanographic research vessels in the world. Owned by Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Observatory, Vima was involved in historic research. She sailed over a million miles, collecting seawater and sediment cores, performing underwater photography, seismic studies, and mapping the ocean floor. And as one of the research scientists who sailed on her says, it was a time consuming and difficult process. And then you put it on, a, on the wire that's overboard, you put it down in the water to whatever depth, depth or depths at which you want the sample and then take your sample and then move the ship to the next uh, station, wh wherever that was. Uh, miles or or uh, tens of yards away mm -hmm. and uh, take your sample uh, filter uh, either filter or transfer it directly into sampling bottles that would be stored to be brought back to Lamont where I'd work on the work on them in my lab depending on what they were and what I was after Although Vima's place in history is secure, it helped confirm the theory of continental drift. Dr. Biscay says it wasn't easy and at times dangerous. This guy was, uh, I forget how, he was, oh, he was on deck and had waves breaking on deck and he got washed over. And oh this, no. This is in, uh, winter at night and oh. not a happy situation, not a happy combination. Oh. So for the, the first thing you have to do is get the guy back aboard. Well, we try, we tried as the waves were bopping, uh, bo bobbing the ship up and down, tried getting up, him up, but couldn't, he was, uh, he was below the, uh, the surface of the water compared to the deck of the ship. So we couldn't just haul him up by reaching down and, and grabbing him and hauling him up. Somebody who was a, an experienced swimmer mm -hmm. went overboard with a, a rope that was, was put around the guy to haul him back on, on board.
talked about tradition and the sea and how important it is. The SV Mandalay, our floating home, has its own set of traditions. The Sounds of Amazing Grace. It's the hymn that fills the air on the SV Mandalay. Every time the crew, sometimes assisted by a few hardy passengers, raise the sails on the majestic tall ship. But why? A former captain of the SV Mandalay was British. And knowing the story of John Newton, composer of Amazing Grace, he thought it fitting to remember the sometimes troubled and tragic history of sailing and the slave trade. The hymn's history is well known. Newton, pressed into service as a young man, rose through the ranks and eventually became a captain of his own ship, a ship that transported African slaves. However, during one voyage, his ship was hit by a terrible storm and he cried out to God to be saved. Miraculously, he did survive. And following his ordeal, Newton experienced a Christian conversion, eventually renounced slavery, became an ordained minister and abolitionist. Although he wrote many hymns, Amazing Grace, his haunting hymn of redemption is his masterpiece, opening with these unforgettable words. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. History and tradition join together as we raise the sails on the SV Mandalay. All of the Caribbean islands are tied to the sea. That heritage is reflected in a variety of ways. In Port Elizabeth, there's another little shop, barely noticeable except for the sign, the Sargent Brothers Model Boat Shop. Inside, authentic models of the many ships that sail the Caribbean, accurate to the smallest detail, all hand-carved and beautiful. Timothy Sargent is the son of the founder and has been carving for as long as we can remember. I've been building boats now for almost 30 years. Wow. And I learned from my older brothers. They started by building um, coconut boats like this as a kid and take it to the seawater just for fun. And by looking at all the boats coming to the harbor, the idea come to them that they can make something looking like those. So that's how the business started over 50 years ago. Wow, they are so beautiful and so detailed. And yes, you can order one of these hand-carved beauties, but be patient. The price ranges from about 250 to <laughs> up right up to six, seven thousand US. And how many hours does it take you to? to well, the to bigger finish? ones take about five, six months. The smaller ones take about three weeks to make. Which is the local boats we use for whaling. And yeah. this one here is made from gumwood, and the tree is right next to us here. Yeah, it's a gum wood and it's a, that's the only local wood we use. Why is that? Because it's soft to work with. Uh-huh. And the others we have to import from mainly Central America. Now look at all the carvings that's hand carved. Yes, yeah, all hand carved. Everything is done by hand, no power tools. Marching. 
But for all the history, tradition, wonderful stories, the best part is still the sailing, the wind, the waves, the experience. Well, that's all for this week. Time to raise the sails and see where the winds take us. I'm Ana Garcia, and we'll see you next time on Secrets of the Caribbean.